These are the last images of Millie Dowler leaving school on a normal day. But the next 14 hours, her last 14 hours, would be a living hell. Her remains were found 25 miles away in Yateley Heath Wood in Hampshire six months later. It's not clear how she died. He was the coldest, most calculating, cruelest person uh, that I ever met, and, and I hope I never meet anyone like it. Uh, everything Levi did was just for Levi. He didn't care what effect it had on those around him, his family, his friends. Uh, thoroughly, thoroughly evil man. Too many similarities, Levi. Too many similarities for the question not to be asked and for you not to say why. No comment. No comment. But following his confession to the murder of 13-year-old Millie Dowler, police have now confirmed they're reviewing a number of other cases. I suppose you could say that it sort of draws a line under this dreadful, dreadful story of Millie's abduction and subsequent murder. When a 13-year-old schoolgirl seemingly vanishes into thin air while on her walk home, an exhaustive search is launched to try to bring her home safely. Years would pass, with investigators being no closer to bringing the perpetrator to justice. That was until a seemingly unrelated crime blew the case wide open. Welcome back to Cold Case Diaries, where we shed light on mysterious cases from across the country. Today, we'll delve into the case of Millie Dowler, the British schoolgirl who was snatched from the streets of Surrey. But first, if you still haven't subscribed to our channel, don't forget to like, subscribe, and click the bell icon below, as it motivates us to create more intriguing content for you. So, without further ado, let's dive right into the mystery. Walton-on-Thames is a town in northwest Surrey, England, roughly 15 miles outside of central London. As the name would suggest, the town lies along the River Thames. This idyllic riverside setting seemed like a perfect place to raise a family with all the amenities one could want. It was here, in Walton-on-Thames, that Amanda Jane Dowler, known as Millie to those around her, was born on June 25, 1988, to parents Bob and Sally Dowler. She grew up on Walton-on-Thames alongside her older sister, Gemma. Millie and Gemma were very close and loved spending time together. In the weeks leading up to the incident in March 2002, the pair had been having sleepovers in the same room so they could stay up late into the night, chatting away and eating sweets that they had stored up. Gemma described her sister as a vibrant girl with a twinkle in her eye. Millie's friends shared this opinion, calling her generous and kind. She was the type of person who wanted to put a smile on others' faces. Millie was also a skilled saxophonist. She was a real extrovert and a people person. Millie was the type of young girl who could talk your ear off and the light of her family's lives. The day started like any other, as is so often the case. It was a Thursday on March 21st. 2002. 13-year-old Millie spent the day at her Heathside School at Weybridge. After an uneventful day of learning, Millie planned to walk to the train station from school with her friend Danielle. The two needed a long overdue catch-up. They left Heathside School at 3.05 p.m. and set off to the station. Danielle later recalled that Millie was her usual playful and happy self. They boarded the train and reached Danielle's stop in Walton-on-Thames. Millie usually got off on the stop ahead, but the girls decided to grab a bite to eat at the station's cafe so they could keep chatting. It would be easy enough for Millie to walk home. She was happy to have the extra time to keep talking to Danielle. Over a hot plate of chips, the girls chatted away about anything and everything. Millie knew her dad, who was working from home, would be expecting her back, so she did the responsible thing and made a plan to place a call through to him. Both her and Danielle's phones were out of credit, but she was able to borrow one from a group of school kids who were also at the cafe. Once Millie was on the phone with her dad, she told him where she was and when she would be home. Danielle and Millie went their separate ways shortly after 4 p.m. when Danielle's sister arrived to walk her home. 
Danielle knew Millie would be walking back alone and asked whether she would be okay. With a giggle, Millie responded, of course. It was still bright outside, and Millie was familiar with this route. She lived in the area her whole life, and it was a straightforward path home. Millie had no doubt in her mind that she would be home in time for dinner like she had promised her dad. Millie walked off down Station Avenue, away from the station cafe. She was seen at 4.08 p.m. by one of Gemma's friends who was waiting to catch the bus. It arrived less than a minute later, and this witness recalled not being able to see Millie once she was on board. This didn't strike her as particularly odd. She thought she may have just popped down one of the side streets. But it was something that she noticed. At 5 p.m., Gemma got home and saw her sister wasn't in yet. She asked her dad where she was. He replied that he thought Gemma would be meeting her on the route. Immediately, they both had a sinking feeling in the pit of their stomachs. Millie, not being home on time, was entirely out of character for her. She always let someone know if she was going to be even 30 minutes late. By 7 p.m., Millie was still not home, which sparked her dad to call the authorities. Thankfully, they jumped on the case without hesitation. Within hours of Millie being reported missing, residents in Walton on Thames knew that they needed to be keeping a lookout for her. Many officers were called in, and they began searching the local fields while helicopters were looking for any sign of Millie. Sarah Payne had been murdered in Sussex just two years prior, while Kingston Gorse, where Sarah had been taken from, is in West Sussex, 50-odd miles away from Walton-on-Thames, the memory of her case was still fresh in the public's mind. The same detectives that worked on Sarah's case were brought in to assist those working on Millie's. The hope was that Millie could be found alive if their response was swift enough. On March 23rd, two days after Millie vanished, Bob and Sally made an appeal for information about the disappearance of their daughter. Once her story hit the headlines, it was known across the United Kingdom. The media were instrumental in pushing Millie's face to the wider public and getting as many informed as possible. However, this positive side of the media would soon turn dark. One week after Millie's disappearance, a reconstruction of her last known movements was aired on BBC's Crime Watch. Her parents also gave an interview and again appealed for anyone who knew anything to come forward. The reconstruction was put together with the hope that people driving down the route that Millie took that day may have seen something that could assist the police investigation. The first two weeks of the investigation saw the authorities receive over 4,000 calls from the public with potential information about the case. There were alleged sightings of young Millie from all over the country, with one coming in from Fiji. The focus now was shifting through these calls and trying to sift through what needed immediate attention, what was irrelevant, and what could be followed up on later. Gemma's friend, who last saw Millie, was questioned by investigators who wanted to make sure she hadn't forgotten any details of that day. Millie was simply there one second and gone the next. The Surrey police were having a hard time making sense of this. How could she disappear in broad daylight in an area that should have had multiple witnesses of any kind of incident? Despite taking hundreds of statements and conducting countless house-to-house -house inquiries, the months began to pass without any major leads pointing to what happened to Millie or where she was. By June, the Surrey police investigators approached the Dowlers and advised them to start preparing for the worst possible outcome. What they meant by this was that the chance of finding Millie alive was slim. Bob and Sally persisted in sending text messages to their daughter holding on to the hope that she might still be somewhere safe. During that same month, a reward of £100,000 was offered by the son. Despite this incentive, no one came forward with any helpful information. On September 18, 2002, everyone's worst fear was realized. A couple had been out in Yately Health Woods foraging for mushrooms when they stumbled across human remains. They ran back to their car and called the authorities to alert them to their finding. Showing how prolific Millie's case was at the time, 
They even mentioned that they believed they had found Millie Dowler. Investigators rushed to the scene and began collecting evidence and crime scene photos before the body was transported for a post-mortem examination. Due to the level of decomposition, they had to wait before making a positive identification. 24 hours later, it was confirmed via dental records that the body of Millie Dowler had been found. There were no items or clothing at the scene. Millie's school uniform, backpack, and cell phone weren't with her body. In fact, 21 years later, these items still haven't been recovered. Even though authorities were fearing the worst, Millie's case had still been classed as an endangered missing person. Now, after the remains were found, it was obvious they were dealing with a homicide case. Experts were brought in to try and identify how long Millie's body had been in that spot of Yately Health Woods. Using the natural growth of plants around her, they determined that her body had likely been in this spot since the week of her disappearance. Now that Millie had been found, the hunt for her killer was on, and time was ticking. But I'm sure you won't guess who the police turned their attention to. Bob Dowler. Initially, Bob understood that they needed to rule out anyone close to Millie, but as the police's interest in him persisted, his frustration grew. He spoke on this years later, saying since he knew he was innocent, all of the time spent looking at him was time not spent on tracking down the real killer. When detectives were searching the Dollar home in the early stages of the investigation, they found a few notes and poems written by Millie in the months leading up to her murder. Some of them mentioned some clashes with her dad. Now you can hardly call this unusual for a teenage girl. What kids don't have arguments with their parents from time to time? Millie also expressed feelings of inadequacy, saying her sister Gemma was prettier and smarter than her. Again, this seems like something many siblings go through growing up, especially at Millie's age. The Dollar family was left alone to deal with the unrelenting scrutiny of the media, desperately chasing a story to splash on the front page. They were stalked by photographers, who at times even hid in their garden and photographed during the most difficult time in their lives. But even the Dollars would admit that that was nothing compared to what a certain news agency did. This scandal came to light in 2011 when it was publicly revealed that Millie Dollar's voice veil messages on her mobile phone had been intercepted and deleted by a journalist from the British newspaper News of the World. The journalist had hacked into Millie Dollar's voicemail while she was still missing, trying to get exclusive news and possible information about her whereabouts. When the voicemail messages were accessed and deleted, it gave Millie's parents false hope that she might still be alive since they believed she was accessing and clearing her messages herself. When this news came out, there was a real public backlash against the media. It leads to the closure of the News of the World newspaper. Extensive investigations, inquiries, and legal proceedings followed, which exposed the widespread illegal phone hacking and unethical journalistic practices happening in the British media industry. For 20 months following her disappearance and murder, all lines of inquiry and pursuit of leads resulted in nothing concrete. That was until a call came in from London's Met Police. An officer who had transferred from Surrey Police to the Met Police DCI Sutton, was looking into a string of attacks on three women, some that even resulted in murder. He mentioned that they had their eye on someone in particular, and while looking at this man, he noticed something. He had previously lived at 24 Collingwood Place in none other than Walton-on-Thames. The front door of his apartment was less than 100 yards from where Millie vanished from. One of the senior investigating officers from Surrey Police was the one who took this call. He recalls the moments when he heard this information, making the hairs on the back of his neck stand up. Could this be a coincidence? Or was this Millie Dollar's murderer? The suspect in the string of London attacks was a man called Levi Belfield. Levi Rabbits was born on May 17, 1968, in Islesworth, London to parents Jean and Joseph Rabbits. When his surname was changed from Rabbits to Belfield is unclear, 
But we do know that Belfield adopted his mother's maiden name. During his childhood, Belfield's father passed away after a battle with leukemia. He was raised alongside his four siblings on a council estate in southwest London and attended Crane Junior School. In his early teens, Belfield faced a conviction for breaking into a house and stealing various items, an incident that occurred in 1981. Subsequently, in 1990, Belfield got involved in a physical altercation with police officer, resulting in a second charge. Although his criminal records reflect numerous offenses and convictions, none of them were as severe as the accusations that would later be leveled against him. Belfield has fathered 11 children with five different women. His ex-girlfriends later described him as initially charming before he revealed the true person behind the facade. He was controlling and abusive, using his large frame to intimidate them. All the women shared similar stories about their experience with Belfield as a partner. Detective Chief Inspector Colin Sutton, who handled later cases involving Belfield, provided his perspective on the man, stating, When we started dealing with him, he came across as very jokey, like he's your best mate. But he's a cunning individual, violent, and can switch from being nice to being nasty instantly. On February 4, 2003, 19-year-old Marsha McDonald got off the 111 bus stop at Piercy Road bus stop before setting off to her home in Hampton. The talented violinist and netball player had enjoyed a movie with friends before hopping onto the bus. Marsha was described as quiet and hardworking, She was taking a gap year with the hopes of traveling to Australia before starting university. When Marcia was only yards from her front door in a completely unprovoked attack, she was suddenly struck at the back of the head with a blunt object. When Marcia was discovered bleeding to death by a witness, an ambulance was called and she was rushed to a hospital. Tragically, Marcia lost her life two days later. Then, On May 28th of the following year, another distressing event unfolded involving an 18-year-old, Kate Sheedy. That day, Kate was celebrating her last day at Grumley House Convent School, where she had been head girl in her final year before study leave for their A-levels began. Kate spent the evening with friends at a karaoke bar. Once she was done, she got on the H-22 bus and went back to her home neighborhood in Islesworth, London. As she was walking home, Kate noticed a suspiciously parked car by the roadside. The engine was running, but the lights were deliberately turned off, which struck her as odd. To avoid the vehicle, Kate decided to cross the road. As she was crossing the street, the car sped towards her, hitting Kate. Shockingly, the driver didn't stop and reversed over Kate's body before speeding away. Incredibly, Kate managed to drag herself off the road and get help. When she arrived at the hospital, the true extent of her injuries was revealed. Her lower back had been torn open, her liver was split in half, her collarbone was broken, and she had multiple broken ribs. One of her lungs was punctured, and the other had collapsed. Kate was well and truly on death's door. She spoke to the telegraph, saying, I remember in the third week I was in hospital, I woke up and I cried. I cried for hours and hours, for days, at the thought that someone had tried to kill me. Tragically, just three months later, yet another young woman fell victim to a brutal attack. Amelia Delagrange moved to the UK from a small village in France to improve her English. Her parents, Dominique and Jean-Francois, described their daughter as always happy and smiling. She got her bachelor's degree in France before living in Spain for some time. When Amelia first moved to England, she lived in Manchester before eventually settling down in London in April 2004. Amelia worked at a bakery in Richmond and was studying applied languages. She met her then-boyfriend, Oliver Lafont, a fellow French-born person living in London, Oliver later recalled the first thing that drew him to Amelia was her smile. 
Amelia was a cautious young woman. She was reluctant to walk anywhere alone, especially late in the evening. On August 19, 2004, Amelia met up with friends at Crystal's Wine Bar in Twickenham. She invited Oliver out with her, but he was occupied packing up his house for an upcoming move. They said goodbye, and Oliver said he would see her the next day. Amelia was seen on CCTV footage boarding a 267 bus in Twickenham just after 9.30 p.m. In a cruel twist of fate, Amelia happened to miss her stop. She got off at Fullwell Bus Garage and started her walk home in the dark. The last time anyone saw Amelia alive was 10 p.m. 30 minutes later, she was found unconscious with blunt force trauma to the head. It was clear from the pool of blood that surrounded her the attack on Amelia had been vicious. She was rushed to West Middlesex Hospital. Shortly after midnight, she was declared dead. Following the attack and murder of Amelia, investigators received many names from locals of violent men who may do something like this. One of those names was Levi Belfield. He was brought in for questioning and the investigators who did the interview felt that Levi was a real lad. He didn't take the whole thing that seriously and seemed jovial throughout the process. Since Kate Sheedy survived the attempt on her life, she was able to provide the investigators with a detailed description of the car that hit her. This happened to match the one Belfield was driving at the time. CCTV footage from the night of her attack showed that this car had followed Kate's bus before pulling over after she got off and launched the attack. Investigators then looked into the CCTV footage from Amelia and Marsha's case. Again, a vehicle could be seen following the bus they were on. Both of these vehicles could be linked to Belfield. By the end of 2004, investigators felt they had enough evidence to follow through with the charges against Belfield. On November 22nd, he was arrested on suspicion of the murder of Amelia Delagrange. Three days later, he was charged with three counts of abuse, and on December 9th, he was charged with assault. Belfield remained behind bars, awaiting a trial. By early 2006, he was charged with Amelia's murder. In addition, Belfield was charged with the attempted murder of Kate Sheedy and the attempted murder of Albanian woman Irma de Grossi, who had been hit over the head with a blunt object after getting off the bus like Marsha and Amelia. In May of that same year, he was also charged with the murder of Marsha McDonnell. In July 2005, Belfield was questioned on Millie's case. He was asked directly whether he was involved. Belfield replied, no comment to each question asked. At this point, the authorities didn't have any evidence that directly tied Belfield to Millie's murder, just because he lived in the vicinity didn't mean he was the one responsible. Further investigative work was needed to find the link. The detectives focused on speaking to ex-girlfriends to see if they had anything useful to tell them. At the time Millie was taken, Belfield was dating a woman called Emma Mills. Emma confirmed the pair lived in her Collingwood Place flat with her children. She said at the time Millie went missing, they were house-sitting somewhere else, so their flat was empty. Emma did say that on March 21st, she couldn't confirm Belfield's whereabouts. He got back to her sometime late that evening. Emma seemed to think Belfield was wearing different clothes than when she saw him leaving in the morning. The pair went to sleep together, but Belfield woke up sometime between 3 and 4 a.m. and headed back to their flat. Emma then told investigators something that caught their attention. On March 22nd, the day after Millie disappeared, Belfield moved them out of their Collingwood Place flat without prior warning. They still had two months left on their lease, so she didn't understand why the sudden move was necessary. He wanted them to move back to a previous place they had stayed in, despite the condition of the flat being extremely poor. It was hardly fit for children, Keeping in mind the type of partner Belfield was, Emma couldn't do much to protest the move and had to just go along with it. Levi Belfield was made to stand trial for the murders of Marcia and Amelia, the attempted murder of Irma de Grosche and Kate Sheedy, 
and the attempted kidnapping of another woman. The trial began on October 12, 2007, at the Old Bailey in London. Belfield had pleaded not guilty to all accounts. Brian Altman was the prosecutor for the trial and stated these women were targeted victims of a predatory man who stalked bus stops and bus routes in vehicles looking for young women to attack. Sunil Garu was called onto the witness stand, and he had quite the story to tell. Sunil, who was an associate of Belfield, had been in the car with him on the day he attacked Irma. Watch this, Belfield told him, before jumping from his vehicle and hitting Irma over the back of the head with a blunt object. Predictably, Belfield tried to put the blame on Sunil, claiming it was him who attacked Irma. This was despite Irma positively identifying Belfield in a photo lineup. Another piece of information that came out at the trial was Belfield's suicide attempt six days after Amelia was murdered. He had broken down in his bedroom and taken an overdose of antidepressants. A friend found him. The friend reported that Belfield then said, You don't know what I've done. He was taken to a mental hospital but discharged the next day. On February 25, 2008, the trial concluded. Levi Belfield was found guilty of the murders of Amelia Delagrange and Marcia McDonald and the attempted murder of Kate Sheedy. The other two charges were dismissed due to lack of evidence. Following his conviction, Levi Belfield was publicly announced as a prime suspect in the abduction and murder of Millie Dower. Investigators had linked him to Millie's case using CCTV footage that showed a reg Dao Nixia driving down the road at the time Millie was last seen. The car was owned by Emma Mills, who, as we know, was in a relationship with Belfield at the time, with the pair living not far from where Millie was abducted. In 2009, the Daily Mirror reached out to Levi Belfield for comment. There's not many red Dao's floating about in Walton on Thames, he said, so we got to be realistic about it, and then I've got to be careful about how I answer these questions. I did use the Dao once, and I was stopped by the police once in it for speeding. Why he thought this was a good statement to the media, we'll never know. Like Millie's clothes, phone, and backpack, the car has never been found. In March 2010, following further investigative work, Levi Belfield was charged with the abduction and murder of Millie Dowler. His trial began on May 10th, 2011. Mr. Justice Wilkie was presiding over the court. This is an excerpt from the prosecuting barrister's opening statement. On this day, an entirely innocent and quite ordinary diversion to a station cafe to buy some chips with some school friends was a decision that cost Millie her life because it meant taking a fateful journey along Station Avenue. The trial continued over the next six weeks before a verdict was reached. Levi Belfield was found guilty on June 23, 2011, and given a second life sentence. He maintained his innocence for the next few years before finally admitting to what he had done. What Millie experienced at the hands of this monster was truly terrifying. In January 2016, Levi Belfield detailed what he did to Millie, admitting his responsibility for her. When he gave his statement to officers, Belfield insisted he speak to female officers. On February 10th, the Dowler family released the following statement, a warning ahead of this. What you're going to hear is graphic and harrowing. We feel we need to say something in addition to the information that has already been made public, as we do not think what has been revealed reflects the true heinousness of this man, the statement read. In May 2015, nearly nine months ago, we were informed that Belfield had requested to speak to Surrey police about Millie. Belfield made it clear to police that he would only speak to female police officers. Belfield provided the officers with a harrowing account of Millie's final 14 hours, giving details of her abduction, repeated abuse, torture, and then finally how he murdered her. Belfield told the police that after abducting Millie and assaulting her at his flat a few yards from Walton Station, he then drove her to his mother's house. 
He reversed down a long driveway and then abused her in broad daylight over the boot of his car. Belfield then moved her to another location where the abuse and torture continued for a number of hours until the next day when he finally strangled her to death. The statement ended, We believe that they should know what Belfield did to our beautiful daughter and sister, Millie. The abduction and murder of Amanda Jane Dowler is one of the many cases that will forever be scarred into British history. Other cases have potentially been linked to Levi Belfield, including multiple other murders. Since the evidence remains too weak to charge him, he has not been convicted of anything further. What did you think of today's case? Share your thoughts in the comment section below, and don't forget to like, share, and subscribe to our channel for more captivating true crime stories. Until the next time, stay safe and keep your eyes peeled for the next mystery to unfold.